it often surprises me that students, uh, even students of American history, know very, very little about the Panic of 1837. And while this isn't an American history course, and I'm not going to go through all of the details, the ins and outs of the Panic of 1837, it's shocking to me that people don't even know much about the fact that it actually happened and what it was and why it was important. It was an extremely important event. It was basically a, 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 a nationwide chain reaction bank failure, panic. Um, sound familiar? Uh, I mean, it was basically the Lehman Brothers collapse, the housing collapse, the banking crisis, the TARP crisis of its time. Um, only there was no Federal Reserve, there was no government intervention, there was no sort of plan to deal with this. And so like the Great Depression, the stock market crash, this crash was based on over-speculation, it was based on a lot of different things, but ultimately it, it resulted in a run on the banks. If you've ever seen, for example, It's a Wonderful Life, where George Bailey saves the Bailey Savings and Loan by handing out a few bucks here and there while panicked depositors want all their money back, well, it doesn't happen like that. That's a movie. Um, people want their money, and they want it now, uh, and they don't care about the fact that other people have their money uh, invested in different kinds of things, houses, businesses, and so on. So the panic happened because people had a run on the banks, and each bank was out of money, and each bank you to issue its own money as well. So this was a huge problem, and it led to a tremendous collapse in, in economic growth and productivity. Now, why is that all so important? Well, obviously, here's Henry David Thoreau, brand new college graduate, ink's hardly dry on the diploma, and suddenly he's been told, congratulations on graduating, welcome to the Depression. Uh, there are no jobs. Um, but as, a, as an individual, uh, Thoreau is sort of thrown into this maelstrom of some bigger calamitous event that he has no control over. And um, that's pretty tough to swallow when you're a self-reliant guy who's been, as a young kid, uh, developing this philosophy inspired by Emerson and others about taking control of your circumstances and being your own person and, and, and whatnot, and then to find out suddenly with a cold slap in the face that, you know what, you're pretty, your circumstances are pretty dependent on the circumstances of others and what's going on around you economically. So what happens during this period is a questioning uh, takes place among a many, many people, not just Thoreau, but a lot, um, a questioning of one's role in life and in society. Um, you know, I, it, it's, it's a country that, this, this one is a country that has prided itself on individuality, uh, and yet we seem to be yoked together by economic things. Um, and so I'm not as in charge of my own destiny. It's a questioning of what economics is. That takes place as well. What is economics? What, what um, you know, these are, you know, this is a country that by 1837 hadn't really studied economics very much. Um, you know, laissez-faire, not much government. I mean, the federal government at the time was just a guy in a house uh, and a whole bunch of other guys who got sent from different places, and they met every now and then passed a couple of laws. Seriously, there just wasn't a lot of legislation that was going on, so there wasn't a lot of economic oversight or involvement of the government in the economy. The economy basically did what the economy wanted to do and what people wanted to do. And a questioning of how does one survive, how does one thrive, how does one get ahead in an environment like that? What's the role of one person to another? What's the role of, uh, collectively? That kind of stuff. On the one extreme, you've got Henry David Thoreau, who says, this is my response, this is my answer, this is what I I decided. On the other extreme, you have someone like Karl Marx, who comes along and says, this is simply a Hegelian dialectic event, and it's going to lead to an, a certain outcome known as communism. Um, one of the other things that the Panic of 1837 spawned, though, and you see this also if you study writers of the Great Depression, is a tremendous outpouring of creativity. Um, you know, it's a funny thing about not, per, not being able to pursue uh, wealth uh, in a time when wealth is hard to come by, that people actually sort of pursue what their calling is. They have different perspectives. You know, you have people who go out on the road and look at Okies who are traveling down Route 66 and they decide to write a novel about it called Grapes of Wrath. Uh, you have people who uh, decide to engage in artwork and photography about what they're seeing in the world around them. A uh, whole generation is changed by adversity. And you had that here, the sort of forging and strengthening 
of that generation that is forever defined by that hardship that, that, that they're put through. We saw that in the, in the Great Depression. You saw it with the Civil War, the adversity of the Civil War creating the realism movement. Maybe we're going to see that now because this is a pretty tough time that we're going through. And maybe we'll see an outpouring of creativity uh, among a generation of writers and, and uh, uh, filmmakers and, and artists, but uh, we'll just have to see. But certainly the Panic of 1837 was was a, a huge event. It was the event economically uh, prior to the Civil War. Thoreau was no longer happy with the paths that society had created for him or his generation. You know, when you grow up saying, well, no, you know, if you work hard and you save your money and you'll get ahead, blah, 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 and then you find out that's a lie, um, that's pretty disappointing. So he took his dissatisfaction. I wouldn't call it bitterness, just dissatisfaction. Um, he was, as the British would say, somewhat gobsmacked by what had occurred. Um, like everybody, they were just shocked, surprised. How could this happen? Um, took his dissatisfaction and melded it with the earlier calls for a national cultural independence movement and decided to go out and live his philosophy. Now, he had tried other things. Um, Thoreau was not some wild-eyed um, you know, uh, philosopher. Um, he was a teacher for a while. Uh, quit his job at Concord Academy because he didn't believe in corporal punishment and, and his bosses told him you had to spank children and he didn't want to do that. Uh, so quit it based on principle. He worked doing all kinds of different work. He was a survey man. He surveyed property and, and created surveys for property. Um, so he knew a lot about that. Knew a lot about um, you know uh, land and, and, and wilderness and, and, all, uh, and all of those kinds of things. Had, had the makings of a pretty good engineer. Uh, he was uh, also involved in his family's businesses. His family um, ran a pencil manufacturing company. In fact, uh, Thoreau is the guy who finally figured out how to insert graphite into a wooden pencil in such a way that the graphite, being slippery by the way, didn't fall out. Uh, he invented that. If it weren't for Thoreau, we wouldn't have the pencil, or at least we'd have pencils whose leads keep slipping out of the wood. Um, he's the guy who did it. Didn't patent it. Uh, family didn't make a huge fortune as a result. But he tried a lot of different things until finally he had kind of a gutful and said, I, I, don't, I don't know what I want to do. I think I want to be a writer. I think I want to be a lecturer. I think that's what I want to do. Um, he started hanging out a lot with Emerson. You know, Emerson lived in Concord. Thoreau was from Concord, and so he was greatly inspired by Emerson, and in those early years, he even lived with Emerson for a while and did odd jobs around the Emerson household to kind of earn a little bit of uh, money and get himself going and share his writings with Emerson, get some feedback on it and that kind of stuff. So um, this is more of a, a sort of a how-to or self-improvement book, only not dogmatic. You know, Franklin comes out with his autobiography, and he basically comes out with all this wonderful wisdom. This young man is how to get ahead in life. Let me show you what I I did with my life, and you go out and do it, and you'll be successful. And of course, Franklin su defines success not merely by, you know, material things, but to a large extent, that's what he's talking about: is material prosperity, uh, as well as improving one's community. Um, so there's a roadmap that Franklin gives us in the way to wealth. Autobio his autobiography, Poor Richard's Almanac, you know, all these wonderful pieces of advice from an old man, um, you, know, not, you know, either a borrower nor a lender be, a penny saved is a penny earned, all these wonderful little pieces of wisdom that he collects and put in, puts in his work that tells a, a young person, this is how, young man, you can get ahead. Uh, well, if you're Thoreau and you read it and you said, well, yeah, but what happens if you're born in a sucky time when the, you can't get ahead no matter how hard you work? What do I do then? And so he decides to write this kind of anti- how-to book, uh, which is not dogmatic. It's not an old man. It's a young man. Um, and it's not telling other people how to live. It's, hey, I read all those self-help, self-improvement books on how to get ahead. Not one of them worked, so I decided to go out and do something, and this is what I did. Uh, it becomes a kind of a s personal declaration of independence. You know, it's no coincidence that he moves into his cabin on the 4th of July. Hello, Independence Day. Um, so he's kind of saying, I'm going to just forget about everything that I've been taught, everything I've grown up with, and I'm going to just go find out for myself how a person ought to live. And I'm not going to go into it with preconceived notions. I'm not going to say, well, when I was in third grade, this is what they told me I needed to do. No, I'm going to go out and find out for myself. I'm going to go live it. Uh, and see what I ought to do and what I ought not to do. If the old people in my life gave me great advice, I'll keep it. If it finds out that the old, if I find out that the old people in my life gave me crappy advice, I'm going to ditch it. Uh, 
Finally, on a more practical level, it was this opportunity for him to commit himself to an intensely focused period of thinking, reading, writing, a period he felt that was kind of, was very essential to launching his career as a writer. So he, he, he really needed a couple of years. He spends two years, two months, and two days doing this, living this existence out by the pond, and it bought him time to produce material. So he's writing in his journal every day. He's writing lectures. He's writing essays. He's writing this piece. He's writing all kinds of things. He's reading voraciously. And so the point being that this was his chance to say, time out. I want to take a little bit of time and figure out what it is I want to do with my life. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm 20 some odd years old. I still don't know what I want to do with my life. This is my chance to call a time out in life and figure out what it is I want to do. You know, a lot of people live their whole lives, he says, not knowing until the very end what they should have done with it. Doesn't it make sense to take a little time out early in one's life, early on when you're still young and can change your mind, um, and figure out then what it is you want to do and then live it? There was another major reason, other than the Panic of 1837, however, that motivated him, and that is that Thoreau knew that he had tuberculosis tuberculosis, even as a young man. And uh, this was called consumption at the time, and it was always fatal. Um, it was just a matter of when. Thoreau lived to be 45 years old, um, and so he did not have long to live. He probably would have died much, much earlier had it not been for the fact that he lived an incredibly healthy lifestyle. He walked miles every day. He ate a very healthy diet. Uh, he was quite a, a health enthusiast, uh, but he still only managed to live to 45 because of his tuberculosis. He knew he had tuberculosis. He knew his lifespan would be cut short. And so it becomes imperative for him at an early point to decide, how should I live?